Well, as we all know, Monday, April 8th is Eclipse Day. On Saturday, April 6th, Troy Brewer was a guest on the Michael Knowles show on Daily Wire, and he discussed his views on the April 8th eclipse. Well, after that video came out, Mike Winger posted this on his YouTube community page. The sign of Jonah was not an eclipse. Jesus said it was related to his burial and resurrection. Don't worry about any pastor out there that says, but there's another layer to this prophecy, and goes on to add up a bunch of numbers and random associations to predict stuff. Also, there are not seven Ninevehs directly in the path of the eclipse. That isn't true. The recent interview on Michael Knowles' show was a terrible misuse of scripture, math, and logic. So today I want to dive into this topic a bit. I'm not going to show you the clip because I'm almost sure my video would be demonetized if I did that. Instead, I'll just provide a link to the Michael Knowles video in the description so you can watch it on your own. First of all, let's address the Nineveh claim. Troy Brewer said that there were cities named Nineveh in Texas, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Virginia, and Nova Scotia. I went to the trouble of looking up the Ninevehs in question and marking them in white for you. As you can see, there are indeed seven Ninevehs in seven states along the eclipse's path, and one in Nova Scotia, as Troy Brewer stated. The problem is that they're not all in the total eclipse area. The one in Texas is just outside of the total eclipse area, so the sun is probably about 98% eclipsed there. The one in Missouri is about 90%. The ones in Indiana and Ohio are totally eclipsed, but the ones in Pennsylvania and New York are between 95 and 98 percent, and the ones in Virginia and Nova Scotia are around 90 percent. So if by directly, Winger means that there's no total eclipse, I suppose he's right. Some of them are between 89 and 99 percent. But Troy Brewer said that the eclipse would pass over eight cities named Nineveh in the U.S. and Canada. He didn't say it would be a total eclipse in all eight of them. So I can see what both of them are saying here. Being a stickler for accuracy, I guess I would lean toward agreeing with Winger's claim that they're not all in the direct path. But it's not like Troy Brewer is just making up the fact that there are eight cities named Nineveh that will be significantly impacted. So now let's address the sign of Jonah part. In Matthew 12, we read, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Then in chapter 16, we read, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now, both of these incidents were recorded in Matthew's gospel, so we have to assume that they were two separate incidents. In the first one, Jesus definitely linked his resurrection to Jonah's story. But in the second one, where they asked specifically for a sign from heaven, he made no reference to his resurrection. He just said the sign of the prophet Jonah. Was Jesus saying that the sign of Jonah was a sign from heaven or in the heavens? In Luke 11, we have another account of the Matthew 12 passage. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. 
Luke 11, 29 through 32. Again, there's no reference to his resurrection, and there's no mention of Jonah in the belly of the fish. So what was the sign of Jonah? Troy Brewer said that in Jesus' day, the sign of Jonah was understood to mean that the sky went dark. And he referenced the Assyrian eclipse, also known as the Bur Sagali eclipse of 763 BC, that many believe occurred in the time of Jonah's prophecy to Nineveh. But Chris Roseborough says that Troy Brewer just made that up. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this, with this generation, and they will condemn it, for they repented at what? Watch this. They repented at the preaching of Jonah. The biblical text, Christ says, you know what caused the Ninevites to repent? It was the preaching of Jonah. No mention of an eclipse at all. So we got a big problem here. And that is, is that um, Troy Brewer, he's making stuff up. From Wikipedia, the Bursagali eclipse occurred over the Assyrian capital city of Nineveh in the middle of the reign of Jeroboam II, who ruled Israel from 786 to 746 B.C. According to 2 Kings 14.25, the prophet Jonah lived and prophesied in Jeroboam's reign. The biblical scholar Donald Wiseman has speculated that the eclipse took place around when Jonah arrived in Nineveh and urged the people to repent. Otherwise, the city would be destroyed. This would explain the dramatic repentance of the people of Nineveh as described in the book of Jonah. Ancient cultures, including Assyria, viewed eclipses as omens of imminent destruction. And the empire was in chaos at this time, struggling with revolts, famines, and two separate outbreaks of plague. The eclipse is also mentioned by the prophet Amos. Amos was also preaching during the reign of Jeroboam II and refers to the eclipse in Amos 5, 8 and 8, 5 and 9. In these passages, Amos uses the eclipse as a prophecy of doom and exhorts Judeans to repentance. Donald Wiseman's lecture was published in the Tyndale Bulletin 45 years ago. So, no, Troy Brewer didn't just make this up. The Tyndale Bulletin is an academic journal published by Tyndale House in Cambridge, England. This isn't Elijah List or Charisma Magazine. This is a publication for scholars with academic credentials. According to Wikipedia, Donald Wiseman was a biblical scholar, archaeologist, and Assyriologist. He was professor of Assyriology at the University of London from 1961 to 1982. I always wonder why a pagan city like Nineveh would dramatically repent in sackcloth and ashes just because some Israelite prophet told them that they would be destroyed in 40 days. I believed it because I believed the Bible, but it seemed out of character for a pagan nation to do that when we see so many pagans clinging to their idolatry and immorality. You would expect them to just mock Jonah or maybe even throw him in prison or kill him. Instead, they believed him. Why? It would make sense that they believed him if there had been a sign accompanying his message, like the sky going dark, which was interpreted as an omen in the ancient world. Now, admittedly, this is somewhat speculative, but it is based on the words of a respected archaeologist who was an expert on Assyria. Chris said that Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah and that there was no mention of an eclipse, which is true. But on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 repented at the preaching of Peter, but his preaching was preceded by supernatural signs. They heard the wind, they saw cloven tongues of fire, and then they heard the disciples speaking of the wondrous works of God in their native languages. In Acts 3, Peter preached again to a crowd that gathered after a lame man who was well known was suddenly walking around in Solomon's portico. So yeah, they responded to Peter's preaching, but his preaching was again preceded by a miraculous sign. So the fact that Nineveh responded to Jonah's preaching doesn't preclude the possibility of a sign preceding his message that got their attention. So I'd say that Troy Brewer could have provided some clarity about the city's name Nineveh that aren't in the total eclipse path and the speculative nature of the Nineveh eclipse. Charismatics as a whole should be more precise in their analysis and should offer an occasional disclaimer about conjecture. That could help prevent a lot of the controversy. But at the same time, Mike Winger and Chris Roseborough 
could have done a little research on the Bursagali eclipse in ancient Assyria and Donald Weissman's 1979 lecture in their criticism. How about we all try to do better? Thanks for watching and be blessed.